Well, welcome, palipidologists. Uh, as you know, uh, coming up on Wednesday is the exam. So I won't um, post a lecture for then. Uh, it's 11 a.m., which is the regular time for this class, uh, in my office, uh, which is uh, 310G Cascade Hall up to the bell tower. Uh, if you don't have access uh, to the um, Cascade Hall, um, come up to the top of the stairs in the bell tower next to the bust of Thomas Condon and the Metasequoia tree and knock on the door for me uh, or give me a ring. <clears throat> Um, I'll be at my desk here and she'll be able to let you in and um, I'll come looking for you anyway um, at about 11 if you haven't arrived. Uh, pretty simple test, um, multiple choice and a short answer primarily on the USDA classification of uh, soils. I don't think you'll have too much trouble with it. Um, today I want to talk about diagenesis. <clears throat> Uh, diagenesis is um, what happens um, when um, sediments and soils are buried. Uh, diagenesis is um, usually defined as the alteration of a sediment after sedimentation. But it also, of course, includes um, alteration after a burial. <clears throat> uh, and we are um, very interested in this because uh, when you think about it, in a sedimentary system, salt formation is a form of early diagenesis. And later diagenesis, uh, that is diagenesis soon after burial, can show somewhat similar forms because we're still actually pretty close to the surface, not that uh, not that different. <clears throat> um, and uh, teasing out these differences is, of course, sometimes quite um, difficult. Uh, diagenesis is kind of related to metamorphism. If we have pressure here, this is zero. This is ten kilobars of pressure. Um, that's deep within the Earth's crust. Um, here we have uh, temperature, 100 degrees C, uh, 200 degrees C, uh, 300 degrees C. Um, because of the geothermal gradient in the Earth, um, which is usually about um, 10 degrees per kilometers, Um, we don't, this doesn't exist really. Um, it does get hotter as you go down um, into the Earth's crust. Um, so um, what we're dealing with then uh, is um, these kinds of fields here. When we get out to about here, <clears throat> at more than 200 degrees um, of uh, temperature uh, and at various depths, uh, we are talking about metamorphism. Um, this is the area of diagenesis. Uh, we're talking about these kinds of um, areas. Um, this here would be zeolite metamorphism. This would be blue schist metamorphism, which you find in subduction zones. Um, this would be green schist out here, where we get to um, a high temperature. Uh, but um, not a particularly deep, uh, deep burial. <clears throat> so diagenesis, we're talking about everything from surface alterations, um, including soil formation, to the kinds of alterations that occur um, with um, burial itself. Now the key to understanding diagenesis has been long understood is what's called a paragenetic sequence. so that we can actually look and see uh, what the relationship is of different mineral phases uh, in the um, rock itself. 
Uh, early on in my career, I discovered something rather interesting. Uh, this is siderite in a spherical form called spirosiderite. Uh, and that siderite was um, in the middle of what appears to have been a, um, a root trace. And that root trace was also disrupted by, uh, by feldspar. So this is a root trace. with a steel, the central woody part, uh, a cortex, and an epidermis out here. The siderite um, mineral was evidently later than the root itself. So the root grew, the siderite cuts across that root growth ring pattern, and therefore, uh, since it cuts across it, it has to be actually um, quite a bit younger than um, the root trace itself. This feldspar, uh, is growing across the cortex of the root as well. Uh, and uh, this also then uh, is quite a bit younger than um, the root itself. Um, these parigenetic sequences are how we establish the order of events in diagenesis. Now, siderite itself is an iron carbonate, um, and it is precipitated by certain sorts of bacteria. Uh, that are involved in the decay of the root. So this would have been a relatively early diagenetic um, event. The formation of feldspars, on the other hand, orthogenic feldspars, feldspars that are uh, formed in place, uh, is generally a late diagenetic feature. So we're talking about one here and one here. Um, we can build up orders of different sorts of events in diagenesis, and this is a classic technique uh, of petrography, where you look at these cross-cutting relationships, see what cuts what. It takes a lot of observations, and you can build up um, a general idea of um, what um, is first and what is uh, second. Now, a part of the problem in identifying uh, paleocytes has been um, that uh, they are, in fact, altered. Uh, from um, a surface soil uh, quite a bit. Um, the burial uh, does uh, a whole bunch of things almost immediately. Um, there are three um, alterations that are especially uh, troubling for paleosols. Number one, burial decomposition. Now, a pretty typical um, distribution of organic matter with depth in a soil uh, this is percent C organic, this is depth. Um, it's pretty typical for soils to have a distribution that looks somewhat like this. Uh, it's pretty typical as well as to have quite a bit of organic matter up the surface. That's in the A horizon, organic plus um, mineral, and for it decl to decline pretty dramatically um, with depth in uh, in any kind of a profile. Um, we hardly ever see this in a paleosol, however. What we normally see is something more like this. Uh, it declines by an order of magnitude, by a factor of 10, basically. Um, the organic matter uh, immediately after burial uh, declines rather dramatically. So this is soil. This is paleosol. Interestingly, though, um, there is uh, often a, an increase toward the surface which reflects the original distribution near the surface. Uh, but it's, it's, it's small. Uh, less than one um, weight percent um, of um, organic carbon uh, in the soil itself. Um, the reason this happens is uh, because of decomposition, uh, which is another word for decay. Uh, when the soil is first buried, uh, it's buried with its microbiome. It's buried with a lot of bacteria and other um, creatures, um, uh, also eukaryotic creatures like um, amoebae, 
uh, springtails, a whole bunch of different organisms. And what happens when the soil is buried is that many of those organisms start eating the other organisms and start eating up all the loose organic matter and then they migrate up through the burying material uh, to um, feed another um, ecosystem. Uh, this organic matter is in demand and uh, as long as the soil is not buried too deeply uh, or too rapidly or then um, that organic matter will decay naturally in a moderately aerobic environment even in a somewhat reducing environment, um, it also will start to um, decay. Uh, fossil soils, buried soils, almost always have uh, at least an order of magnitude less organic matter than their modern counterparts that are well drained. Now, this doesn't go for swampy environments, of course. In swampy environments, they're kind of challenged for oxygen anyway. Uh, and uh, in a swampy environment, a peat can get buried. It already was very low in oxygen anyway for the peat itself to accumulate and turn into a coal without too much loss of organic matter. Uh, these are special circumstances, of course. Uh, the general rule for a well-drained soil um, is that the organic matter will be gone. This is especially um, a problem for mollusols. Uh, mollusols are often defined by the amount of organic matter at the surface, um, but um, fossil mollusols usually have very little of that organic matter um, remaining. Number two, burial reddening. Um, what happens um, with a burial and with age uh, is that uh, ferric hydroxides are dewatered to oxides. So we go uh, from FeOOH to Fe2O3. This is the mineral called goethite. Uh, it's a yellow-brown color, <clears throat> and this is the mineral hematite, which is fire engine red. Uh, what's happened between the two is, of course, these things have been driven off. Uh, it's, a, it's a purely oxidized iron now, uh, and it changes its color really quite uh, dramatically. This is not an oxidation. It is a dehydration. Uh, burial reddening. Now, um, this has been a source of quite a bit of uh, confusion, uh, actually, um, because uh, the um, reddest soils today are in tropical regions. And the reason why they're, they're in tropical regions is that those soils are very old, and so they have been dehydrated on long time scales. And they have actually formed hematite within them. Uh, most temperate soils have a lot more goethite than, hemat than, than, than hematite because they're relatively young. Uh, the ice just um, left many temperate regions only um, 12,000 years ago, and so they've only been forming since that time. Tropical soils have been forming over millions of years in some cases, and so they're very, very red. Uh, so people looking at red paleosols in the record have often thought that they were tropical soils. Um, when in fact the redness is a product of their burial dehydration, not their original uh, color. Another source of confusion has been that some people seem to think that deserts are red. And yeah, there are some spectacular red deserts around. Uh, some of the most spectacular red deserts are the red deserts of Utah. Those deserts are red because the rocks that are exposed in the desert are red. And those red colors come from paleosols or buried soils of Triassic and Jurassic age that formed in much more humid climate, not in desert, in forested environments like um, the soils of a Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona. We can see the huge logs. We can see that these forested soils um, were very deeply weathered. 
uh, to smectite uh, clay um, and even a little bit of kaolite. Um, and the desert soil in that area is red because the rocks that the desert soil is forming on are also red. In other parts of the American West, where we see the Cretaceous Age marine rocks of the Mancos Shale, um, the soils are gray because the rocks are gray. In desert soils, what happens is there's very little weathering, very little weathering at all. The desert soil is short on moisture and it's short on plant life. And so um, <coughs> desert soils are not necessarily red. Uh, we often see this mistaken notion that uh, red beds form in deserts. No, red beds form in valley of soils. Uh, and just think about other deserts that you might have seen through nature documentaries. Uh, the red deserts of Australia are again from ancient uh, Paleozoans. There are red deserts in Argentina formed in the same in the same way. But the deserts of Israel, of Iraq, of Iran, of Afghanistan, of uh, China, um, like the deserts of Nevada, uh, and um, in the, in the Mancos Shale, these are all gray because that's the color of um, the rocks in their, um, in their area. So burial reddening has been a source of some confusion. The red color of the rocks and the nature of the minerals, whether it's gertite or hematite, does not necessarily uh, reflect um, the original oxide uh, nature of uh, the soil uh, itself. Uh, so that's um, number two. Number three is burial glazation. Uh, this is a process um, where you get bluey gray colors. So gley is actually a Dutch term. The Dutch are really big on soil science. Uh, and it's a process, uh, it, it's a description for something that is blue, gray, or green, gray. Um, these are the colors that you get in polder soils in, in Holland, uh, soils that are relatively um, waterlogged. Now, these sorts of blue-gray colors are actually quite common in paleosols as well. Uh, in um, a pretty typical um, soil profile of um, an A horizon, a BT horizon, and a C horizon. This is down near the water table. Um, this has um, brown clays. This is black with organic matter. Um, this is, uh, for example, an alpha salt. Uh, when this gets buried, then strange things can happen. Um, if it's in a floodplain soil, so here's the water table down here. Uh, it's only brown to about here. It's gray below that because there's no oxygen to oxidize the iron and create these, uh, these, different, uh, these different pigments. Uh, when the whole thing is buried, let's bury it under sand, and now the water table is up here. Uh, this whole profile is now finding itself um, in an environment which is like a, a bog. It's still an A, a B, T, and a C, but what you have now is a system of gray, green, and red material. Red, gray, and this is gray as well. Now this gray is the original gray color. That's the original glazation because that was down below the water table. Um, a little soggy, hard to light, and not much oxygen getting down uh, to, that, uh, to that level. Um, this brown gertite has gone to this red hematite because of burial um, reddening.
And this organic matter at the surface, this um, organic matter that was formerly in the A horizon is now fueling the growth of a whole set of bacteria that can thrive under these low oxygen conditions and can chemically reduce the area around um, root traces. Uh, this is actually how you get drab halide root traces. Now you've seen these. The, um, the red material of the matrix is like so. The root trace is like down the middle here. It's thin. And then there's kind of a diffuse. This is these are sharp contacts here, other side of the root. Uh, this is diffuse here. The organic matter of the root is now gone. The organic matter was consumed by the bacteria that can actually thrive in these particular conditions of relatively low oxygen. And uh, they have chemically reduced the Fe3 plus uh, in the original soil to Fe2 plus, and therefore changed its color. Um, very distinctive feature that's very, very common um, in a uh, in a paleosol. Now, the, um, the situation in uh, burial glazation is actually quite similar to the situation that we get in uh, surface water clay. As opposed to groundwater clay. In a groundwater clay, here's the water table right here. Um, the, um, the red, this is a modern soil now. In a groundwater clay, uh, we have um, a water table here. We have red Bt and gray C, or sometimes it could be a BG, where we have minerals like pyrite or siderite down here. This is oxidized. This is reducing in the original soil. Um, that's um, a fairly clear indication of an ancient um, water table. In surface water clay, we can have a, um, a, a clay area, very clay bed, for example. Uh, and that um, clay uh, is not allowing the water to percolate down into, um, this is the water table down here. We have standing water. Oops. after a rain. And that water can actually produce a, a whole set of glade channels around roots that looks very similar to this burial uh, glazation. The difference, of course, in surface water clay is that you have to have a very clay, um, impermeable aquaclude or layer that does not allow the water that falls as rain at the surface to fall down into the water table. And so it's perched. Uh, you have a perched water table. The water will be up here, standing water, and it doesn't get, the water is basically in this interval here. Now, what happens in that kind of a situation is that the glaying, the burial or, or the reduction itself, is going down into the soil, very similar to this. Now, um, we can distinguish this situation of surface water glay from burial glazation actually quite easily uh, because um, in, in the real burial glazation, the root traces go down through the soil and suggest that there was no aquaclude. There was no barrier uh, for the transmission of water down into the profile. If there was a barrier or if there was a high water table, those roots would deflect um, to reflect its former uh, presence. 
Um, this, this is actually quite a rare thing. Um, it's something that seems to affect agricultural soils more than others. Um, the, the aquaclid uh, commonly um, is the plow layer itself. Uh, the plow layer, um, which is the level at which the, 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 the disks of the plow turn the soil up, uh, tend to accumulate a lot of clay material washed down in that big crack created by the plow overturn. Uh, and then that can perch uh, the water table so that after a heavy rain, there is standing water. Um, this is actually quite bad for the crops because they can't um, thrive in this kind of a situation either. Uh, so um, this situation is rare in modern soils. Um, we do have a few cases of it in the fossil record. Mostly um, what you, when you see this kind of thing, when you see these wonderful drab hollowed uh, root traces, um, they are the product of burial glazation. Now, burial glazation is actually an, an important phenomenon. Um, here it reflects in the standing surface water clay, it reflects a peculiar kind of drainage, uh, which, is, which is rare. Um, this, in an ancient in example, uh, is telling us something quite um, important. And that is, it's telling us about um, the last crop of trees that were there. Uh, burial glazation is fueled by the organic matter of the root itself. Now there'll be lots of roots that died in the soil and then rotted out and oxidized and disappeared completely. Um, those um, roots are dead and gone, um, but only the ones that had original organic matter that can fuel bacterial reduction after burial are the ones that are going to create this burial glazation. So the glade root traces, as opposed to the unglade root traces, are an indication of standing biomass, of the actual uh, productivity of the soil uh, immediately uh, before it was buried. Those are the big three. The big three are um, burial decomposition of organic matter, um, the um, burial uh, reddening of the um, oxides and burial glazation of uh, remnant organic matter um, in uh, the soil. And what an amazing transformation uh, they make. Um, here's the soil, um, which is uh, a rather subtle kind of a soil profile uh, with a, a dark brown surface. A, um, a reddish brown subsurface over a gray uh, water table uh, area. Uh, and it's been transformed into this very strange caricature of a soil, which has greenish gray surface with his fingers of material going down into the bright red material, no longer this subtle color difference, and then above that, a gray. Um, these uh, diagenetic alterations make a caricature of um, the soil. And it's this caricature-like feature uh, that have made um, paleosols sometimes uh, somewhat difficult uh, for uh, people to recognize. Uh, they don't look a lot like uh, modern soils. They can sometimes look really, really altered. There are other things too that we need to take into account when we look at um, when we look at soils. Um, number four. A diagenesis. Um, clay diagenesis is the alteration of clays um, with, uh, with burial. It's particularly marked in the transformation of smectite, which is a swelling clay soil, uh, usually with um, calcium and um, sodium, um, with uh, depth of burial, uh, this is transferred, transformed to illite, which is a potassium uh, rich clay. Um, the reason is uh, that uh, these materials, these ions are relatively soluble. And as the clay becomes more and more compacted, uh, and loses water as the water is forced out, these leave with um, the water. Uh, this iron is rather less easily dislodged from a clay lattice, uh, and it tends to stay behind. And so you have a transformation from a smectite 
through to a, um, a kind of a quasi um, illite, one that has a rather different uh, composition. Uh, this is changing the chemical um, composition. Um, this is uh, sometimes called potash metasomatism. Uh, potash, of course, that is K2O. Um, and what it's implying is that uh, potassium is coming in. Um, now, there may be situations where that happens as well. Um, I, think, I think that's actually pretty rare. I prefer the term illitization. Uh, eventually, of course, you're going to end up with muscovite. Eventually, when you cross over the um, diagenetic field um, into about 300 degrees centigrade or so, um, these clays are going to actually change to a proper mica, which is pretty much a dehydrated uh, clay. Um, it occurs at about 100 to 200 degrees centigrade uh, temperature and at about 2 to 4 kilometers depth of burial. Uh, we can actually uh, see it um, as a, as a, in, in two ways. One way to understand it is that it's a form of ostwald ripening. So you have um, very, very uh, fine clay uh, that forms greater domains um, where the clay is starting to get more coarse. Um, it's also losing uh, a lot of its <coughs> of its other cations, particularly calcium and uh, and sodium, eventually end up with um, with muscovite in 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 nice big books of um, mica that are all uh, forming a uh, a schist. That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it, from the point of view of a <coughs> X-ray diffractogram. Um, is that when we uh, put this under an X-ray diffractometer, uh, we can actually get a whole bunch of peaks. This is illite. This is smectite. This is the 15 angstrom peak. This is the 10 angstrom peak of um, of Elite. Um, as the clay itself is altered, we can do this with an X-ray diffractometer. What happens is these smectite peaks get smaller, and the illite peak gets sharper and sharper and sharper. Uh, we can see that uh, what is happening um, is a transformation of um, one uh, for another. Uh, these changes are important to take into account because they can potentially change the chemical, chemical composition of um, the paleosol. Uh, that compositional change is relatively minor unless you have uh, rocks that are fairly sandy uh, because it's very hard to get elements in and out of a consistently clay pile of paleosols. But if you have paleosols that are in relatively sandy uh, sediments, then uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite possible uh, to have a substantial uh, change. <clears throat> Compaction. What also happens to a paleosol um, when it is buried is it gets squeezed. The weight of overlying rock can be really pretty uh, substantial. One really easy way to figure this out is to uh, look at uh, clastic dikes. So a clastic dike that was like this in an original soil, it's basically a crack in the soil filled with sand from the top, uh, is going to be tigmatically folded. As the clay itself uh, is compacted, you can measure now the amount of compaction as the um, as the, the total distance here versus the distance around these folds. Uh, this one here is a, a compaction to about 60% of what it was um, originally. Now, there are quite a number of paleosols that show this pretty clearly. 
uh, this kind of compaction, and you can measure the compaction um, directly. But we also know that different sorts of soils have a um, relatively uh, coherent behavior under burial diagenesis. Uh, we can uh, figure out if we know how much sediment is likely to be on top of it, and we can do that by measuring sections of all the sediment in the area, uh, how much it's likely to be compacted. Um, Aridosols are uh, less compacted than our vertisols. Um, we have some pretty standard engineering formula that we can apply to paleosols that we derive from the study of compaction uh, by people in the oil industry. Compaction is really uh, something uh, that is of importance uh, for the oil uh, industry. Cementation. Uh, paleosols, of course, at the surface are loose and friable, but pretty much when they're a paleosol and buried to any reasonable depth, they're going to be hard rock. And they'll mainly be a hard rock because of uh, cements. Uh, cements that come in between uh, the grains. Uh, that basically are fine-grained materials that glue them uh, together. Uh, those cements are silica. Uh, calcite, and hematite. Now calcite and hematite cements are um, very common in paleosols. So um, those uh, form in nodules and form in BT horizons of paleosols already. Uh, silica is also found in some paleosols, but pretty rare. Uh, but silica cement, when it's really pervasive, um, will uh, change a paleosol into a very hard rock indeed, a, a porcelanite um, like, uh, like rock. Organic matter also is changed. Colification processes. Um, with burial, um, and particularly with deep burial, and we're talking now down to about 100 to 200 degrees uh, centigrade, um, we change something that is a peat, a friable mat of um, brown organic matter, through to a low-grade coal, coal, which is a lignite, through to um, anthracite. Um, anthracite is a high grade um, coal. Um, what happens in the process of coalification is that the volatiles are lost and carbon is retained. So it becomes richer and richer in carbon, um, uh, uh, less and less rich in hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, and this gives a an increased calorific value to um, the coal. Uh, anthracite um, has a high, is a high calorie burning fuel that is used for the manufacture of steel. Uh, it's known from a number of places in Pennsylvania. Um, lignite and peat cannot be used for that purposes, although they do have some um, commercial uh, uses, making briquettes, um, and uh, you can even dry out peat and use it to burn in your fireplace to keep the cottage warm. Um, this colification process is well understood. Um, the transformation through these various grades of um, coli material is well documented, um, both in terms of the heat and the pressure that is needed uh, to do it. Uh, it's well understood in the coal industry as a guide to past um, alteration of the coal basin and as a guide to future uh, use. Uh, clearly, um, when you are mining coal, um, you will have a specific purpose in mind. Some of these sorts of coals are of um, a higher usefulness than, uh, than others. Uh, sulfur um, is uh, also a problem. Um, with coal formation, sulfur does tend to get driven off. So anthracite can be uh, useful. 
Uh, but in many corals, particularly those that formed in mangrove swamps, uh, we have a high sulfur content. And these are actually terrible to burn. Um, the sulfur content remains in the coal until, um, well, even at fairly high degrees of alteration. And when you burn it, that sulfur is in the atmosphere as sulfur oxides, which are noxious pollution uh, that uh, we really do um, want to get rid of. Um, the coals in the Colito Formation around Coos Bay in Oregon were of this sort. Um, we were desperate for coal during the war years. Uh, production down there peaked during the war years, but now there's no future for that coal basin because um, nobody wants to burn that kind of coal these days and put so much sulfur into the air. Many of the original coals of Pennsylvania also uh, have a high sulfur content and are very polluting coals. The more valuable coals now we recognize are in um, Wyoming and Montana and formed in completely freshwater basins of coal um, and thus have a low uh, sulfur uh, content. Oil generation. Now most oil um, is of uh, marine origin. Um, uh, oil is actually created and generated uh, from the decay of uh, microorganisms that are primarily marine. They are basically the distilled essence of carbonaceous uh, shales uh, that are formed in the ocean or in estuaries or in um, lagoons. Uh, but there is some oil generation in oil shales uh, which are found um, in, uh, in lakes themselves. Now the, uh, it's kind of like the situation with, with coal. We're talking now about forming liquid hydrocarbons from uh, ordinary organic matter. Uh, generally, we're talking about 180 to 200 degrees centigrade uh, and 1 to 2 kilometers of uh, burial to form an oil from a good source rock uh, which is rich in microbial organic, uh, organic matter. Um, oil generation um, ceases pretty much when you get to anthracite grade. Uh, when you get to temperatures higher than this and depths are higher than this, um, what happens is that the material is cooked to such an extent uh, that you just get gas, natural gas, CH4 or methane. <clears throat> Australia, sadly, um, most Australian um, oil prospects are rather poor. Australia has a lot of gas fields and a lot of good anthracite coal not a lot of good oil uh, fields. Um, the oil itself is, of course, a fluid that can migrate uh, through materials and can alter the rock itself. Um, there are also brines associated with oil formation. Um, the burial uh, features create uh, brines or salt water um, at, um, at depth. Um, the, um, this can actually be relevant to paleosols. Uh, for example, um, in the um, the oil field of uh, Santa Barbara and Ventura, uh, in the Ventura Basin of California, uh, the paleosols of the Sespe Formation Um, which is an Oligocene unit, are uh, folded, um, and the um, oil generated from the Monterey Formation, which is in another fault block over, uh, form these ponds. This is oil, this is brine, and there could be a little bit of gas at the top. Uh, the paleosols are clay, and therefore are a cap rock. Um, and that cap rock is what um, actually uh, keeps the oil from sort of percolating through to the surface. Actually, it does percolate through to the surface in a few places around Ventura. Uh, quite spectacular to see uh, these tar pits um, like La Brea. Um, but these are active now uh, where the hydrocarbon 
uh, is coming to the surface, not only near Ventura, but Carpentier and McKittrick, several other places in this, uh, in this, in this region. Um, so paleosols can be affected by the movement of these fluids um, in the Earth's uh, crust. Uh, these are uh, quite um, aggressive in some cases, uh, filling up vugs, uh, creating fracturing, um, hydrofracturing because they are under high uh, temperature and uh, pressure and otherwise deforming the sediment. Now let's talk just a little bit about metamorphism. Metamorphism is, of course, the more extensive alteration of paleosols, and we have that too. Uh, when we go back into the Precambrian, quite a number of our paleosols have been really extensively um, altered uh, to temperatures of more than 400 um, degrees um, centigrade. Uh, and also deformed uh, into schist and gneiss, even melted uh, to, uh, to gneiss. Um, we can um, see a progressive obliteration of soil structure uh, by the imposition of metamorphic uh, structure. So in a soil that has this nice uh, ped structure, um, eventually we get to a point um, where uh, the material is starting to recrystallize and also getting really oriented so it's forming a schist. And the schist is uh, a, a set of shears that are uh, in relation to the development of folds and uh, nearby, uh, nearby faults. The um, funky kind of irregular structure of the soil is now being aligned into the direction of principal stress um, in the crust. Um, however, even in a schist, we, if we take samples down through here, we can sometimes see uh, characteristic chemical changes of soils, like enrichments in alumina or in silica. Uh, alumina, which reflects the increase of clay content, silica, which represents the increase in quartz um, content. Uh, in highly metamorphosed soils, um, paleosols that are really well uh, developed, we tend to get a whole bunch of highly aluminous minerals like kyanite, sillimanite, uh, fuchsite. Yes, fuchsite exists, named after Mr. Fuchs. Um, this uh, these are minerals which are aluminum rich. Um, they are big crystals. Oh, storolite. They're big crystals. Storolite famously is in crosses. Uh, these are a favorite among Christian geologists to have been dependent. Um, it, it, they form actual crosses of crystals that form um, these are uh, uh, about two centimeters or an inch or so in size. Uh, these storolite crosses, uh, kyanite is also a big mineral grain. Um, they are forming uh, in a, a solid uh, solution um, of the rock itself, and they are overprinting any pre-existing uh, structure. So metamorphism at some point um, will completely obliterate salt structure, even if there's a little bit of chemistry um, remaining. In the green schist faces, um, which is um, the incipient metamorphism, the beginnings of metamorphism, uh, we sometimes see soil structures uh, still beautifully uh, preserved. But as we go further uh, into uh, higher grades of metamorphism, um, eventually the soil is completely destroyed and even its chemistry um, is gone. Um, beyond metamorphism, um, the whole thing might melt and actually turn into a granite or a nice, and then, of course, all bits are off. However, um, I'm of the opinion that many granites are basically metamorphosed paleosols, that they have a strong paleosol uh, component, and this is why there is such a break in composition in igneous rocks between granites, um, which have this infusion of soil and sediment material, and basalts, which are basically direct melts.
from deeper in the earth, from mantle material, which is very, very poor in um, uh, silicon uh, and in, in, in oxygen uh, compared with uh, the material in, in, in the mantle. So there are all degrees of alteration of uh, paleosols. Uh, this whole idea of diagenesis and metamorphism is well calibrated. Uh, we know where we are in temperature and in uh, pressure space uh, in most plants in the world because of prior studies um, on the diagenesis and um, metamorphism of the rocks. And we can try to disentangle that to try and get back to what the soil would have been like, uh, what the paleosol would have been like when it was originally um, a soil. Um, it's a bit of detective work, uh, but it's not impossible to recognize paleosols in the rock record, even though they are changed rather dramatically from the original soil that they were. Well, that'll do for today. Thanks for your attention.